Good morning, everyone. Everyone hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> a warm welcome to our worship this morning for those of us that are gathered in person. And a warm welcome to those who are joining us from wherever you are um, on live stream. Welcome to our worship this morning. There are a couple of wee intimations just before we begin. Firstly, to say that there's a Kirk session meeting a week on Thursday, a week on Thursday, the Kirk session are meeting. And lastly, just to say, if there are some members of the board, oh, we've got teas and coffees, as you know, by the way, so please feel free to come through for teas and coffees. But at some point before we leave uh, the church this morning or into the afternoon, depends how long you're blethering for through there, um, if you want, if some of the board members could be around, because um, I was speaking to Robin, our next door neighbour, and apparently there's, there's a problem with a wee bit of the wall that's a wee bit loose and could be a wee bit dangerous. And he just wants to kind of show us where that is. And then we can begin to kind of make a, you know, a amends to that, to see how we're going to sort and fix that. So that'd be quite good if maybe one or two folks were around to, to see that. These are all our intimations today. Um, we're going to begin our worship in a moment by standing together and calling one another to worship. And as we do that this morning, Tom's going to bring in the Bible, the scriptures. And of course, that's just a symbolic way. You know, symbols are important. You know, I mean, there's a very important one just above there. Symbols are important. And Tom's bringing in the scriptures as a way of symbolically saying we're being invited to bring our story into the story of God, a story that hasn't got a full stop in the last chapter, a story that is ongoing and that we are a part of. So that's the kind of symbolism behind that. So, are you ready to worship then? Yes? We all set? Good. Well, let me invite you to stand where you are. We'll stand together. And let's call one another to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Come you who are hungry. Come you who are thirsty. We come seeking. Let's worship God together as we sing of the Lord's goodness, Father of all wisdom. Sing of the Lord's goodness, Father of all wisdom, come to him and bless his name. Mercy he has shown us, his love is forever, faithful to the end of days. Come then all you nations, sing of your Lord's goodness, melodies of praise and thanks to God. Ring out the Lord's glory, praise him with your music, worship him and bless his name. Power he has wielded, honor is his garment, risen from the snare of death. His word he has spoken, one bread he has broken, new life he now gives to all. Come then all you nations, sing of your Lord's goodness, melodies of praise and thanks to God. Ring out the Lord's glory, praise him with your music, worship him and bless his name. Courage in our darkness, comfort in our sorrow, spirit of our God most high. Solace for the weary, pardon for the sinner, splendor of the living God. Come then, all you nations, sing of your Lord's goodness, melodies of praise and thanks to God. Ring out the Lord's glory, praise him with your music, worship him and bless his name. 
singing, praise him with a trumpet, praise God with a lute and harp. Praise Him with the cymbals, praise Him with your dancing, praise God to the end of days. Come then all you nations, sing of your Lord's goodness, melodies of praise and thanks to God. Ring out the Lord's glory, praise Him with your music, worship Him and bless His name. And let's pray together. Some days we awake and rise to things as they are. A day with something or nothing to be done. And the best we can do is say, it is what it is. And we try to get on. And nothing around us or where our day will take us would ever give away how to you, Lord, our life is more precious than we can ever imagine or say. Some days we get up preoccupied with hopes that linger in disappointment, hearts that refuse to be healed, guilt that doesn't easily yield to pardon, estrangements that cut deep and remain open, and the best we can do is to say with the song, Nobody said it was easy. No one ever said it would be this hard. To where our life is what it is. To where we try and get on. Blind to how you see us. To where it's not easy. To where it is still hard. Come, Jesus, and meet us in these very places. For we bring them with us to worship this morning. And if your love won't find us there, where will it find us? So let us marvel afresh that our life as it is, is the very ground your feet walk to bring forgiveness and restoration. Your hands touch to bring mending. Your voice speaks into our doubting. Your presence endures and travels with us on the ground we stand. Until your love renews us, until your grace sustains us, where it's not easy and still hard until even on that ground we discover our true self lost in wonder love and praise of the God who goes with us hear us Lord as we give to you the prayer you taught us praying our Father who art in heaven Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, I think I'd like to do a wee bit of wondering. Do you ever wonder? Do you ever find yourself wondering about things? Well, let's do a wee wonder together this morning. And to help with our wondering, a wee song. Okay? But it's a wee song that you have to help me sing. Right. If, um, there's not as, quite as many of us in person today, so please feel free to join in virtually and we'll try and hear you. This side of my friends here, if you could sing, Nobody said it was easy. Want to try that? Nobody said it was easy. Again? 
Nobody said it was easy. Try it yourself. Brilliant. That's what you've got to live up to. <laughs> this side. No, no. I need to get the melody. <laughs> Nobody said it would be so hard. Nobody said it would be so hard. Nobody said it would be so hard. Yourselves? He said it was easy. Nobody said it would be so hard. Great, great, fantastic. Do you feel as if you've had a workout already? <laughs> good, good. So some mornings we do get up and we think, oh, you know, it's all I can do to get out of my bed this morning. And we look in the mirror and we think, you know, I can see that face, but that's not how I feel. You know, and we wonder how we're going to get through the day. Nobody said it was easy. Nobody said it would be so hard. And somehow the energy comes to us. Or maybe we're at school, you know, and we would love to have a friend. But people are just being mean around us. And they're not being friendly. Nobody said it was easy. Nobody said it would be so hard. But you know what? We keep faith anyway. And we say, I will be a good friend to someone. Sometimes illness catches up with us. And it reduces what we can do. And we can't see beyond you know, the frustration of that. And what might we sing? <laughs> Nobody said it was easy. Nobody said it would be so hard. And yet, we still find hope to go on. Sometimes we lose what's most important to us. And we think it's as if our story is over. Nobody said it was easy. Nobody said it would be so hard. And yet, even with the pain of that, we allowed that not our loss not to become a full stop, but a comma in our story and life we continue. I wonder where the strength comes from on the days we struggle to get out of bed. I wonder how we manage to keep faith with friendship and know that we will be a good friend even when people are mean around us. I wonder where we find hope to get through what life has become now that illness has settled in our house. I wonder how we manage to continue to find love and meaning and laughter, even after we've lost what meant most to us. We find it because it finds us. Because on the ground we stand, in the day we are in, the love of God comes to energize us, comes to show us that we are worthy of love, comes to give us hope when the thing in front of us seems quite hopeless, comes to give us all we need to go on and get through. Because whether we know it or not, whether we believe it or not, the love of God is active in our life and comes to find us. Not where we want to be, not where we should be, but where we are. It's called grace, and it's good news. Enough wondering.
I would say 10 out of 10. You're all invited to join the choir next week. Even Tom. <laughs> so we're going to listen to a short passage now from Luke's Gospel. We're going through Luke's Gospel. And our reading today is a great example how that if we don't earth the scripture that Tom brought in, if we don't earth it in its own time and context, sometimes we will misunderstand what it's wanting to say to us. And today is a brilliant example of that. And I look forward to taking you through what Jesus is saying this morning. Because for at least some of us, I think it will come as a revelation. Okay. So we're going to have our reading. Margaret, I think it is, it's going to come and read for us now from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 27 to 30. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who ill treat you. If anyone hits you on one cheek, let him hit the other one too. If someone takes your coat, let him have your shirt as well. Give to everyone who asks you for something, and when someone takes what is yours, do not ask for it back. Do for others just what you want them to do for you. Thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. Thank you, Margaret. And we'll explore those. See you later, girls. We'll explore those verses um, together in a few moments. But we're going to give ourselves to song and offer to God our praise as we join voice together and sing, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you Alleluia 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 And it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Alleluia. 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 Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. You shall not live by men alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. So last week we heard Jesus begin what's called his Sermon on the Plain. 
And the Sermon on the Plain is a collection of sayings that Jesus made through his ministry that Luke gathers together in this place in his gospel. And around these sayings, he brings a crowd who have come to listen. A big, big crowd who have come to listen. A bit like this morning here in the church. Huge, big crowd here to listen. But who are they? And where are they from, this big crowd? They are the women and men and children that Jesus had in mind. When, remember, in the synagogue, he stood up and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to do what? To bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to release the captives, to bring recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now last week, we saw that those in the crowd, nine, you know, were, were by and large mostly villagers, agricultural workers, and we saw that 90% of the whole population in Galilee, and in fact Israel, Judea, was made up of folks who kept the economy going by their work in the fields and by their boats on the Sea of Tiberias. But they themselves were impoverished. The political and religious and economic system had complete power over 90% of the population. Their life was marked by a daily and often desperate getting by. The suffering of their children, the worry over where the next meal was coming from, the debt that they had incurred, the illness that was never far away, with no end in sight and with no one to help. That was their situation. And Jesus arose from among them, and it's to them he brings the good news. That those who are impoverished are to be set free. That it's those who are indebted who will be released. That it's those who are blind or refuse to see what's going on who will have their eyes opened. That it's those oppressed by this system who will be set free through God's loving attention. Now if that sounds political, it's because it is. And if that sounds a bit radical, it's because it is. Jesus will be crucified, not because he's telling everyone that God loves them, Jesus will be crucified because the love of God had economic and political implications. Crucifixion was a political execution. In the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus is about to give us the politics of God. So now we're in a place where we can catch how subversive these sayings were then and still remain today. Jesus says, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. Now, if a landowner from the city, because they always lived in the city, arrived in a village in Galilee, and wasn't he happy with what he was seeing? And he strikes you, Jesus says, what should you do? Don't strike him back. You can't win that fight. All the power is on his side. Instead, this is what you'll do. Offer him your other cheek. Now for many of us, we have heard that as an invitation to submit with patience. You know, to whatever's happening to us. And not to retaliate. But would you be surprised to know that's exactly the opposite of what Jesus is proposing. He's saying something way more subversive. He's saying don't submit to the evil. 
but oppose it on your own terms. Do something that will leave the landowner in no doubt about who you are standing before him. Now, in Matthew's gospel, he gives us a helpful insight that makes this abundantly clear. He says, if anyone strikes your right cheek, turn to him the other. Now, to be hit on the right cheek is to be hit by the left hand. And at this time and in this culture, your left hand was always reserved for unclean tasks. So to strike someone on the right cheek with your unclean hand can only be done like this. What's that? A backhanded slap. And the backhanded slap is not intended to cause great injury. It's intended to insult and humiliate. The point of a backhanded slap is to put someone in their place. Now, the people that Jesus are speaking to are familiar with backhanded slaps. And he is saying to them, and this we saying, don't accept this treatment anymore. How? By turning the other cheek. Now, if you turn the other cheek, you're showing your left cheek. And that can't be, you can't backhand that cheek anymore. It's at the other side. So if you're going to strike that person, what do you have to do? You have to strike them with your right hand. But in this culture, people only came to fisticuffs with equals. And the last thing that a landowner wants you to know or sense or to do is to establish equality with you. So to turn the other cheek is an act of defiance. It upsets the balance of power. It's a way of saying to the landowner, I'm no different from you. I am your equal. I am a child of God. I won't see myself through your dismissive eyes. You don't get to dismiss my dignity. If you want to hit me, you'll hit me as an equal. Turning the other cheek was never intended to turn us into doormats. It was to empower us to stand up for ourselves, to show that we know our own value, to refuse to be cowed and live as less than God says we are. It's a way of being in a powerless place and showing that you still hold your own dignity and that you know who you are. Can you see how that's a very different very different way of seeing what Jesus is saying there. Now Jesus invites the impoverished to be creative in the way that they disrupt the system. And he does it in a way that we probably don't catch. But for his hearers, that crowd, they would have been in stitches. So if you look at the Old Testament, you'll find how that the land was divided was into families. Families were given land, they kept the land, they passed it down generations. You would not give up that land easily. Generation to generation. But by the time of Jesus, the rich landowners who lived in the city have swindled the land away to make great big estates. And Jesus says to this crowd, imagine one of these rich guys takes you to court because you owe him a debt. Now, courts weren't the you know, places where you could go and seek justice. Courts were there to support the wealthy elite. So you go there, you're only there for one reason, to be humiliated by the system. To be publicly humiliated. So Jesus says, okay, folks, imagine this. Imagine this guy wants to take the shirt off your back so that you're left with your undergarment. And what Jesus is talking about there is your underwear. So he leaves you standing in the dock with nothing but your underwear. Jesus says, this is what you do. Give him the shirt, yeah. Give him your underwear as well. Can you imagine the crowd gasping and bursting out laughing when Jesus says, stand naked in the court. Walk out of the court naked. 
And when people see you and they ask, what are you doing? Tell them. The guy wanted to shut off my back, so I gave him my underwear too, because he's left me with nothing. Now in Judaism, public nakedness was a shame, you know, it was like, oh, whoa. But here's where the real shame came from. The shame was on the one who made you naked or who left you naked. So Jesus in this saying is saying to the crowd impoverished around, show the court, show the people, show the rich, show your neighbors that this system is so corrupt and so shameful that it leaves you without a stitch. Now it's the courtroom and the rich man who are humiliated. Not the peasant and he in the court were trying to disgrace. Can you see how that's a very different reading than perhaps we might have heard before? A very last one. This isn't in Luke's gospel. But in Matthew's gospel, Matthew brings this alongside these other two sayings because he thinks it fits really well. Jesus says, if anyone forces you to go a mile, go with them two miles. How would we read that statement? Is Jesus saying, you know, try to win someone's approval by showing them that you're willing to do more than they've asked? You know, just by the sheer force of your generosity. You might not want to do it, but just make the effort. And in making the effort and going that extra mile and bending over backwards, you know, you might just win that person over. Is that how we've been taught perhaps to, to read that statement? Well, how would Jesus' first hearers have heard it? The impoverished people in that crowd, what did they hear? Who could force you to go a mile? Do you know the only person that could force you to go a mile in Jesus' time? Was a Roman soldier. Now, legions had to move, and whenever they moved, they had a lot of gear to carry. If you had a senior rank, you know, like a centurion, you might well have your own slave. You'd certainly have a couple of donkeys to do all the donkey work. But see, if you were just an ordinary Roman soldier, you had a whole lot of gear to carry. And you had to carry it. But what you could do is you could press a civilian to carry your stuff for you. So say you were going from Caesarea to, you know, to Jerusalem. And you've got all this stuff. You could grab somebody off the street and say, right, you're carrying that for a mile. And they had to do it. That was the practice throughout the empire. People hated it. But you had to do it. But here's the thing. You could only force someone to do it for a single mile. Were you to cross over that boundary, you had infringed the military code. And if a soldier broke the military code, then he was up for punishment. Now that punishment, it, it wouldn't necessarily know how he was going to be punished. You know, he could have his wages docked. He could be flogged. He could have his rations reduced. He could be forced to stand outside the centurion's tent, you know, with a clod of grass so that everybody made a fool of him. You didn't know what the punishment would be, but you were getting punished. Jesus says, so a soldier forces you to take his pack for a mile. See, when you get to the mile and he's trying to take it back off you, you say, no, I'm going another mile. What do you mean you're going another mile? What are you trying to do? What are you about? Are you trying to get me into trouble? <laughs> Give me that pack back. No. Can you imagine the laughter in the crowd? As what has happened is the balance of power has changed. Jesus isn't encouraging Jews to walk a second mile to win over the soldier by kindness. He's giving them a way of protesting against a practice that everybody hated. Turning the other cheek, stripping naked in court, surprising the occupation troops and placing them in jeopardy with their superiors. These are all ways for the powerless to break the cycle of humiliation, of owning and claiming your own dignity of who you are before God, of knowing yourself to be 
free, even in a system that you can't change. So a crowd of the most impoverished gathers around the good news that Jesus has a way to live as a free person in a situation you can't change. Good news that Jesus has a way to realize and express your dignity to those who don't believe you have any. Good news that Jesus has a way to resist the system that controls you. But without resisting it with violence and without becoming like those who treat you badly. Following Jesus' way is an invitation to trust God on the ground you are on in the circumstance you can't change and be creative in how you respond knowing that the love of God will empower you in what you have to do. We'll give you the power to creatively resist. We'll energize you to know the worth of your own life. We all of us. So that's how that worked. I'm sure that might come as a surprise to at least some of you this morning. That perhaps you have listened to the words of Jesus and acted on them in ways that you never intended. And what I hope this morning is that you've caught something of the revolutionary nature of what Jesus was about. These are the reasons why Jesus gets crucified. But it's not just a history lesson this morning. What does that mean for us today? Well, we all of us have things we can't change. We all of us have things that happen to us that aren't fair. We all of us face things or people who make us feel worthless. We all of us find ourselves at times on ground that we wish we could change, but we just don't have the power to change it. I'll not get you to sing it, but it's the truth of nobody said it was easy, but nobody said it was going to be so hard. That's our everyday reality. But following Jesus might not change the reality we're going through, but it will draw us into a relationship with God that's deep enough not to change the circumstances, but to change who we are and who we allow ourselves to become in the circumstances so that we realize that we have a dignity given to us by God that no one and no thing can take from us until we resist what is if, whatever is blind to our dignity until we learn to live as though God is undefeated by hate. Until we learn to live as though love is bigger than revenge. Until we learn to live as though love is stronger than death. Until we learn to live well, trusting God on the ground where we stand. So this morning, what are you powerless over? What is oppressing your dignity as a human being? Who is blind to your true value? What leaves you feeling a captive, humiliated, worthless or afraid? Because it's onto that ground Jesus invites us to place our trust in God and to discover that in that relationship we will be given a love that meets us on that ground, that releases us to be 
our true self, the true self that God knows us to be. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because he has anointed me. He's given me this task to bring good news to you where you're impoverished. He sent me to proclaim release to you where you feel captive. He sent me to give you sight to where you're blind to your value and how much you matter. He sent me to help you become free of whatever oppresses you. This is the year of God's favor. Not a history lesson. You and I, however distant we are in years, we are part of that crowd Jesus was speaking to. Amen. So if we're going to, this isn't a continuation of the sermon, if we're going to be energized, empowered to live like that, then the thing we need is to know that God is with us, the God in Jesus Christ who is with us. And our next hymn speaks of the closeness of God with us on the ground we stand, on the journey we make, on the road we must take. Christ be beside me. We'll stand to sing. Christ be beside me. Christ be before me. Christ be behind me. King of my heart, Christ be within me, Christ be below me, Christ be above me, to part. Christ on my right hand, Christ on my left hand, Christ all around me shield in the strife, Christ in my sleeping, Christ in my sitting, Christ in my rising, light of my life. Christ be in all hearts thinking about me, Christ be in all tongues telling of me. Christ be the vision in eyes that see me, in ears that hear me, Christ ever be. And at this point in our service, we're going to have our prayers for one another and ourselves. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, we have come before you this morning and give thanks for such a time as this, that we can come together in our church on this day and worship and praise your holy name. We give thanks for our minister, for the teaching he leads us in, of your holy word and we ask you bless him and his family loving god we worship you we bless you for your love which knows will not fail us as shepherds gather their flock so good shepherd you gather us here today 
to feed and refresh us. With God, all things are possible. Lord, we come together because you call us and draw us closer to you and lead us through the coming week. Heavenly Father, thank you that by faith in Christ we have a new nature and pray that we may live and grow more like you, Lord Jesus, in the choices we make. We pray that your grace and love will flow through us to others. Give us grace to love our enemies as Christ loved those who nailed him to the cross. Help us to follow your example and love those who dislike us so that we will turn the other cheek and offer the other one as well. Bless them, Lord, so that their eyes may be open to follow you. Lord, in a world that is becoming more violent and where love has grown cold, we are often tempted to judge, contemn and retaliate against those who hurt or harm us or cause pain to those we love. Give us the grace to live as Christ lived and love others as he loved. What a lesson to teach us on how to treat others. Forgive us for the times that we have dishonoured you by our response to others. Help us to live as you have lived and treat others in a way we would like to be treated. Father, we pray that our life may reflect the love and compassion that Christ has for us. We hear your call to care for others as you care for us, to love as you love, to give and go on giving, to heal, to feed, to nurture and reconcile. Help us to show thankfulness, not only in our praise and prayer, but by following you. We pray for all who suffer and are not cared for. The old who die alone, the young who are neglected or cruelly treated. For the vulnerable who are taken advantage of the hungry and homeless, refugees from war and violence, trapped at borders or in makeshift camps. We pray for those who go where there is trouble, pain and poverty, risking life and limb, facing danger and fear. Help us show thankfulness not only in our praise and prayers, but by following you wherever you lead. For Jesus' sake, Amen. We're going to finish our time together in song a song entitled, We Sing a Love. Let's finish our service offering to God our praises. We sing a love that sets all people free, that blows like wind that burns like scorching flame in folds like air springs up like water clear come living love live in our hearts today we sing a love that seeks another's good that long 
comes to serve and not to count the cost a love that yielding finds itself made new come caring love live in our hearts today we sing a love unflinching unafraid to be itself despite another's wrath the love that stands alone and undismayed come strengthening love live in our hearts today we sing a love that wandering will not rest until Finds its way, its home, its source Through joy and sadness Pressing on refreshed Come pilgrim love Live in our hearts today We sing a burning fiery holy ghost That sees Shades of ancient bitterness Transfiguring these As Christ in every heart Come joyful love Live in our hearts today Go in peace And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with us now and forevermore.